There's a passage in the uh, precept chant that says, I pray that all people will believe in karma so they will stop committing evil. For years I've said there's only one article of faith within the practice of the Buddha's Dharma. And that article of faith is the Buddha's enlightened. And of course then, if you, you have to believe he was enlightened since you can't meet him and talk to him. And that means that you have the potential. And then you can believe everything he said and all the Buddhas that came after him. And if you don't believe he was enlightened, then there's really no point to Buddhism. Because it becomes what everybody accuses it of becoming, which is simply a philosophy. Uh, rather than a religious practice. And that's that article of faith. Well, there's one other article of faith. We have an anomaly, and the anomaly is karma. When the Buddha began teaching, he did not tell anyone that they couldn't believe in other things. And this makes an interesting religion, because we have people that believe in more than one religious belief sometimes. In the Orient, it's very common for them to believe in Taoism and for them also to believe in Confucianism uh, in China, in Vietnam, and they talk about the three religions. And they see Buddhism as simply filling, filling one part of this. And it takes care of, of course, the everyday life of a person. And uh, so they, they always get a little confused when they come bumping up against Western religion because Western religion is typically mutually exclusive. You believe in one thing, you can't believe in another. And uh, I had a good friend say to me a couple weeks ago, I think it's, it's becoming a mark of when I have established a good friendship with people because then they, they become concerned about the fact that I don't believe the way they believe. And I don't mean from a proselytizing standpoint, I mean simply um, I think they care enough about me that they feel that somehow they should make an effort to understand. So sometimes when I make a new friend or a, uh, an old friend becomes a good friend, they will make statements like, do you have a book that I could read? So something simple so that I could understand your belief or I could understand Buddhism or I could understand what it is you do. And I always look at that as being a very nice statement. And I tend to not throw books at people. When they make that statement, I tend to go, well, I'll look and see if I have something. And I really wait for them to ask two or three times before I even worry about a book because I think it's a, it's a very nice impulse upon their part to want to understand uh, what I do and what I believe and what the practice is. And of course the reality is they won't. See, I already know this too. And that's, that's not cynicism, that's just reality. Someone that has a mutually exclusive religious practice can read a book and of course, they'll read it looking for the elements that somehow match what they believe so that they can become more comfortable in themselves and go, well, they don't look like bad people. It doesn't look like they're sacrificing small children and chickens, you know, in the new moon uh, in full moon days. Uh, gee, maybe they're all right because there's a problem. And the problem, of course, is I'm not a bad person. And mutual, mutually exclusive religions teach that people that don't follow what you follow are bad. And they have to be bad. I mean, come on, let's be realistic. If someone who doesn't follow what you follow is immediately going to go to hell upon death and suffer for eternity for a number bigger than anybody can write, they can't possibly be good. They would have to be bad. And of course, we have this concept of evil. So they'd have to be bad and they'd have to be evil. And they'd have to be horrible. And they'd have to be, oh, just all kinds of negative things. And occasionally I, I think that because I'm not intrinsically bad, I cause people some discomfort because without trying, they find that they like me 
And when they like me, they want to understand how someone that doesn't do what they do can possibly not be bad. Notice I stay away from saying being good, just not be bad. Because that's the problem with that mutual exclusivity, is that it's not an issue of being good. I can remember as a small child and as a big child being very confused about people who were what I perceived as being very good who had to go to hell when they died, had to suffer for the rest of eternity, the number that nobody can write because it's too big. And I just couldn't get it. And the explanation that I was given just wasn't acceptable. It wasn't acceptable to say that someone was going to suffer for the rest of eternity because they did not agree with me. And that's what it boils down to. <clears throat> so there is that dilemma. I had this friend, another friend, who said, don't be surprised if I don't show up sometime. I've had a couple friends say that. So I feel kind of fortunate because at this stage of my life, I have discovered I have more than one good friend. And that's really neat. Um, my mother taught me that if you have one close, true friend in your life, you're very fortunate. And of course, you know what a close, true friend is. Those are the people that you can say anything to. You can tell them about your bad side. You can tell them about your pain. And they won't judge. Because true friends don't do that. They'll simply be there for you to talk to and uh, give some comfort and maybe some advice. But if they're very smart, they know nobody takes advice anyway, so why give it? So I find myself in this extraordinary position at this stage of my life in that I have more than one person that I think considers me a good friend because they want to understand me. They want to understand what I do. And this friend that said, don't be surprised if you see me sometime, I might show up for one of your services, you know. It always begins with, a, well, when do you do that? What time is it you do that? He made a statement. He said, uh, you know, I've been uh, kind of looking into this, and I don't think that your religion violates anything in my religion, so there's a problem with me, you know, visiting. And that's a good, honest concern. And the more strict, the more mutually exclusive a religion is, usually the more angst people go through with the idea. I mean, my goodness, there's what I consider a very new religion, just a little over 100 years old. It's not Christianity. It's another one of these religions that started in America. And they absolutely will not allow anybody that belongs to that religion to be part of any kind of religious service with someone from another religion. It's just the way it is, in any way, shape, or form. So, I understand that. Of course, understanding and agreeing aren't the same thing, but I understand that. So, here we are with all of these problems of belief, and we have one belief that's totally indefensible. The belief that the Buddha was enlightened is, to me, is fairly defensible. Because you've probably heard me talk about, well, uh, you have to accept on faith that he was enlightened, but look at his life. Look what he did. Look at the way he conducted himself. That he turned away from the typical path of the ascetic, which was once they found the answer, they were done. And that was very typical of ascetics in that if they found the answer to their quest, they simply sat under the tree and passed away because they had satisfied their curiosity. Even though it was a religious curiosity, they were happy. And the Buddha, we get this very nice story about him being tempted by Mara, by pretty girls and by power and all of these different things that <clears throat> he could have these things because of his great wisdom if he wanted to have them. And he turned away from that. So I think we can make a very persuasive argument. It only can be an argument because it's a matter of faith that the Buddha was enlightened. There's no way you can prove it. 
It's like any other truly religious thing. You can't prove it. But therein lies our faith, the faith in the enlightenment of the Buddha. And I think we're very lucky because we get to meet disciples of the Buddha who are enlightened to a greater or lesser degree. And I think that gives us a taste and a touch of who the Buddha was. But karma, what's the deal with karma? Karma may sound very logical. See, it sounds extremely logical to me. Of all the destinations after death, karma seems the most reasonable to me. But I can't prove it. There's lots of things we do we can prove. The Buddha was a pretty scientific guy for a guy who lived when there was no science. Uh, we certainly can prove the effects of meditation. The Zen school is in an extremely strong position. Any claim they make, well, almost any claim they make, can be proved. We can talk about tension reduction. We can talk about stress management. We can talk about behavior alteration. We can talk about bad habit curing. We can talk about handling great pain. All of these things, we can uh, quantify them. We could pull psychologists and psychiatrists in and they could observe and they could watch what was happening and they could record and they would turn around and say, yeah, it works. Because most psychologists today, one of the things in their bag of medicine is meditation. It's become very, very common when 30 years ago it wasn't. That if you're having a lot of problems in your life, a lot of stress, a lot of difficulty dealing with other people and dealing with what's going on in your life, if you go to a counselor or psychologist, meditation is one of the things they will introduce you to. They don't particularly care what kind of meditation it is. They might introduce you to listening to the sound of the sea at night, you know, and sitting quietly and visualizing the sea so that you learn to calm down. Um, and it works. Meditation works. It always has worked. The only thing that doesn't work is if somebody goes to practice meditation and they don't do it. If they daydream, you know, if they, they do laundry lists in their mind of all the things they have to do in their life, because that's not meditation. But meditation has been proven over and over again to work. Now, when we get to the issue of enlightenment, we have a little problem. That's not provable, but we already know that because we can't prove that the Buddha was enlightened. We can only accept it on faith. But karma... Karma is the law of the universe that says that people that do bad things have bad things happen to them. And people that do good things probably have good things happen to them. And it gets more complicated than that. We borrowed the law of karma from the Hindus. And many Buddhists in the world accept it exactly like it came from the Hindus. Well, almost exactly that we have this transmigration of this substance. Now, the Hindus called it the Atman, which is their word for soul, that the soul would move from one existence to another existence, inhabiting new bodies. Um, an awful lot of uh, one particular philosophy in India talks about the body simply being this temporary house. The yogis all believe this. Temporary house that we inhabit and when we die, the house is discarded like an old run-down shack. And that we start the cycle again, going through. It's been around so long that a lot of ideas have developed around it, like the idea that we're here to learn a lesson. And that's a very interesting concept because uh, the people that live in India <clears throat> don't believe in the, any kind of God that sets up these artificial structures like, well, let's set up a structure where man can learn a lesson. When Sandy passes away, uh, the one I love that comes from the Theosophical Society is Sandy will go to this nice, big, airy room and she will sit there and re review her past life and look at the lessons she needs to learn. Which, you know, when you, you, you look at it at all, it becomes pretty silly because... Sandy's going to figure out the things she didn't learn, and she's going to decide she's going to take this next life so she can learn these things, which means Sandy has wisdom. Well, where did Sandy get this wisdom? She didn't get it just because she died. 
So maybe towards the end of her life she had wisdom. Well then, why would she have to work on these things that she didn't know when she was younger? I mean, the whole thing's full of holes. It's very comforting and it's a very attractive idea that we go to this big room and we watch everything going on and we try to come back and fix our mistakes. And it's also very attractive that there's some old kind of neutral party, maybe a Hindu god or almost god that comes in and coaches us. I read a very boring book, totally fiction, about a group of people that traveled through numerous lives together. It was, it was charming in one way, but it really, I like a little more action. They kept getting in trouble, dying, and having to start over again. Very Buddhist. Kept starting over again. Kept messing up. There was one thing that was not Buddhist in there, though, is that the Buddha, while he was wrestling with this thing, you see, because when the Buddha started the thing we call Buddhism, but he didn't. He just started teaching. And for hundreds of years, people just called it the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha teaching. They did not call it a new religion. It wasn't until Westerners came and they had to start classifying things that the notion of Buddhism came up. He didn't reject Hinduism. What he said was, set it aside, not reject it, simply set these beliefs aside and then after you have cultivated yourself to where you have some wisdom, some enlightenment, then look at them again and prove or disprove these ideas to yourself. Because he was very analytical about the way he approached things. He was a little bit on the critical side. Uh, he had a lot of problems with what was going on in India at the time. One of the things he had problems with was the sacrifice of various life forms. The Indians had gotten into this thing of using scapegoats and so that they would kill doves and goats and sheep and you name it, any kind of livestock, to try to change their karma. That's a scapegoat. The Jews were really good at it too. And so he had a real problem with this. The first story we have of him doing anything is way before his enlightenment way before he's lived the ascetic path, way before he's actually gained any wisdom. All he is is a guy with a big question, and he goes into a temple and starts throwing people out of it. And he throws them out of there because they're sacrificing animals and the temple is covered with blood. We know he was a sensitive guy. It's amazing that he survived, as sensitive as he was. But he went in there and he saw this is absolutely wrong. And it, but in one way, it ties into what the Buddhist search was about. Where did all this suffering and unhappiness come from? Well, you can't walk into a Hindu temple and see life being taken over and over again and blood everywhere without understanding that that's a source of great suffering. Maybe not for you, but it's a source of great suffering for everyone else. And I think from the very beginning he had some ideas, but he had to prove these ideas to himself. And one of the ideas he probably had was that one way to eliminate the suffering of the world is stop being a cause. And this is why I think he hung on to karma. Because if you're out causing other people to suffer, why would you expect anything good to happen in your life? Why would you expect to be without suffering? And this seemed logical. This is something you could figure out without proving it. <clears throat> but the only thing that he technically changed in the notion of karma is he got rid of the Atman. He saw people clinging to that idea. And he saw it as a problem. And I always think of it as a practice problem. In other words, the practice is to gain wisdom. The practice is to become liberated. The practice is to become free. The practice is to see into our true nature, to awaken and become enlightened. That's practice. Whatever we're doing that moves us towards that. That could be meditation. That could be dealing with things we don't want to deal with. That could be serving soup in a soup kitchen. That could be working around the temple. That could be chanting. That could be being quiet when we want to speak and learning 
to kind of keep herself under control. That could be not saying something nasty when we have the perfect opportunity to do it. Practice is a big thing. It's not a little thing. It's not restricted to the Zafu. It's not restricted to the meditation hall or to the temple. Practice is our entire life. And to lead the, the life of a Buddha, to follow the Buddha Dharma, is to have every moment in our life do this. But we're moving away from this kind of critical thinking. And the Buddha said, you see, you can get very wrapped up in yourself doing this. That's one side of having a 24-hour practice, is all of a sudden you become very important. And the next thing you know, you've got a mutually exclusive religion, and there actually are a couple kind of renegade sects of Buddhism that talk like this. If you don't practice this way, nothing good will ever happen, you know, and you'll probably go to some bad place when you die, or you'll, have, you'll be born as a cockroach. You know, you get all of this kind of nonsense. And the reason this is going to happen is because you don't practice the way they practice. We are now moving away from Buddhism. We are now moving away from the teachings of the Buddha. Because the Buddha taught there were myriad ways to become awakened. There were over 10,000 paths to be followed. This is occasionally forgotten. The Buddha saw every one of his disciples as practicing a different path. Because every personality was slightly different. But he saw one thing they all clung to. And that was the notion of self. And so, <clears throat> not in the beginning, but somewhere towards the middle, the Buddha decided he had to get rid of this idea of the self. And I've often wondered if he did it simply because it was such an obstacle for people, or if he did it because that's what he believed. Because I think the Buddha was very sneaky, and he was crafty. And he really didn't care whether he threw something aside that may or may not have been true. He had one object in his entire life of teaching, and that was to help people become free. And everyone was worried about what was going to happen when they were reborn. And that notion was, when Bob is reborn, Bob will be Bob again, because that's what the Hindus believe. And every few years, you see a newspaper article or read in a magazine, usually a kind of sensational magazine, small girl of 12 found in India that remembers her last 16 lives, went back to villages, recognized articles that she had owned, you know, and it just goes on and on and on. And of course, the Tibetans are pretty, pretty strong with this, the idea of recognizing uh, people who had a previous existence and a previous existence and a previous existence. And so the idea becomes, well, Bob continues on. The Tibetan thing that's kind of an interesting twist is that since they really are Buddhist, uh, you could have more than one Bob the next time around. You could have two, three, four, five Bobs. And then it gets a little tricky. How did that happen? Well, that's because there is no permanent Bob. But there is some essence. There is what the Buddha called the mind that travels on. And he called it the mind because he was trying to get away from talking about some tangible thing. And the Hindus looked at the body and the soul as both being very tangible, measurable things. So the Buddha wanted to get away from that. So he talked about the sita, the seed. It's, where it's our root for seed. It's a root for mind. The mind travels on. The experiences travel on. The personality is impermanent. As much as I like Sandy, the next time around when Sandy or I are together, it's not going to be Sandy, but it'll be Sandy's experiences. So we'll still have fun, but it's not going to be Sandy. Sandy might even be a guy. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> what are we going to do there? So this karma idea, it's the, when we look at karma, we see karma, we start slipping back into mutually exclusive religions. We start slipping back into some of those old ideas. And in this thing we chant, and this was written by a Vietnamese monk, the thing we chant as part of our renewing the precept ceremonies, you can see he slipped back. 
I didn't change it because it's, if nothing, it gives us something to talk about. Or I might get somebody to come up to me and say, say, I really like that, but that one thing in there, that sounds like other religions. It does. We hope that all people will believe in karma so they will stop committing evil deeds. Well, karma says if you do evil, evil's going to happen to you. Traditional Buddhist way of looking at it, well, eventually you'll work it out. We realize that when things don't go well in life, we may have a greater opportunity to gain wisdom than if everything just was hunky-dory and went along perfect and we never had any um, adversity, if everything was okay, if everything fell into place. And so what are we learning here? And maybe we're a really nice person until the first time in our life something bad happens. And then all that falls apart because our wisdom, our peace, our serenity, our detachment is not founded on understanding the world as it is for everyone. We're one of those lucky people. We had everything given to us. So, the Buddha keeps the karma idea, but this chant talks about something that some Buddhists kind of push out. You know, they tell little children, you better be good or you'll be born as a cockroach. Yeah. And then, I'll step on you. And so we sound like other religions, and that's because we kept this karma idea from another religion that mothers would say that. Say, well, you could be born as a very low life form, so you better be good. When we come to the practices Zen, we find that we don't worry about that stuff. My first teacher used to say, because he would not get into a religious discussion of any kind, but when people would corner him and they wanted to talk about karma, he'd say, you see karma all the time. Every time you exhale, you die. Every time you inhale, you're born again. And so life and death is happening over and over and over by the second, by the minute, by the hour, by the day. And of course he was right. We see karma that happens very quickly. We see karma that takes a long time. And sometimes we go, well, we'll just have to have faith. That really awful person will get theirs in the next life. And yet, that's not the point of it anyway. I really think the Hindus came up with the idea of karma to try to understand why some people got away with bad stuff. How come they can be so bad and still have stuff? Because they were confused. They thought having stuff was having wisdom was being enlightened, was being happy. Most people that have lots of stuff are not happy. But there was confusion there. The Buddha came along and tried to straighten out the confusion. Karma stayed. Karma was just something that was so ingrained, um, was not universally accepted, but it must have been pretty well accepted where the Buddha lived, that it just went along with it. It kind of gave you an answer to the question you don't even need an answer to. Nobody needs an answer to the question, what happens when we die? Nobody needs that answer. You need the answer to the question of, how can I stop hurting other people? Or even more importantly, how can I stop hurting? But you don't need the answer to the question of, what happens when I die? As one great Zen master said, as he went into the zendo, sat down, gathered his disciples around him and said, in a few minutes, I will pass away. I want to say goodbye to all of you. Now the great adventure begins.